Welcome to the Lawyers Coach Podcast. I'm Claire Rayson and I am here with co-host Ollie Hansard. Great to be with you again, Claire. So we have an interview coming up which is full of energy and someone after my own heart with a business development background who is now chief executive of a firm which is for me always makes my heart sing. So the guest is Sarah Henwood and Ollie tell us a little bit more about Sarah and what she had to say. I really loved her slightly different perspective of leading a law firm without actually having been a lawyer. And, and, and she starts off by saying how much she just enjoys the marketing of people. And it's that interaction and the, the importance of growing the culture of interaction and, and getting the whole firm behind supporting the client work that gives her masses of energy. So Sarah, obviously Chief Executive at Thomas Snell Passmore, the Guinness World Record holding oldest firm in the world, I think, not even just in the UK. Really inspiring and and, and uplifting to hear that their kind of Chief Executive isn't a lawyer. So shall we find out what she had to say? Let's press play. Look, Sarah, let's start with your background. How on earth did you, did you end up to, to become Chief Executive of the, the world's oldest law firm? Well, first of all, let me just say I'm not a lawyer. So I expect you really want to know why I choose to work with lawyers. Um, I'm always intrigued. Always intrigued. (laughs) Um, My background is actually in marketing and business uh, development with professional services firms. And I like working in that sector because I enjoy marketing people, the relationships they have and the services they provide. It's always a pleasure to work with bright people who challenge you. But I say not being a lawyer can be an advantage as I offer a different perspective. How did you get into the, into that role, particularly being a chief executive of a law firm without that, that background? Because that might be you know a bit of friction there, maybe. Well, I have been a chief executive before. I was a chief executive of a charity. So okay. being a chief executive is not a completely foreign role. And I've managed to combine that with my marketing and BD experience in law firms. I've worked in and lived in the US, Asia and the UK. So I've worked with a number of different cultures and I've, you know, dealt with a lot of different different clients, big, small and, and in between, private and commercial. One of the themes of, of this series is, is a, a forward looking, almost like a, a state of the nation review of the industry because we we did a a survey the podcast did a survey in the autumn and just really interested to get your sense of of where the industry is and how confident you are as a leader of a law firm what what the future is for, for the the industry and your business I mean, let's be honest it's a tough economic environment and you know we've been through covid we're now in you know we're not in a recession but we're not fighting brilliantly as a as an economy at the moment. So it is tough, but fortunate at Thompson Stan on Passmore because we have a balance of business, which is both the private client side and the commercial side. And within that, some departments are somewhat recession proof and some departments do even better during a recession versus those which can be a bit quieter. And so we are able to deal with this current outlook. I'd also say because we're of a size that can be flexible, we can take advantage of opportunities, but also move fast to manage risks. We we have realistic plans for growth, and those growth plans are ambitious as well. But sometimes, particularly in the current environment, they may be a bit more slower than we originally anticipated. But I've yet to see anywhere that just has complete linear growth the whole way through. So what do you think the opportunities then are for the business moving forward? Huge, actually, because I think as the sector evolves, particularly with things like AI coming in, there is an increasing recognition of the importance of, and I use a phrase that I came across when I first started in the 80s, which was trusted advisor. You know, AI can give a a lot of answers, but not necessarily the right ones and certainly not the ones that are necessarily in the best interests of the client. And I think there is an increasing space for 
lawyers who really understand a client's particular concerns and what they're wanting to achieve, be that personal and private ones or on a commercial level. And that's something that Thompson, Son and Passmore are very, very good at. We're very good at listening and working with our clients. We have clients that are, you know, generations that they've been with us. And also clients that, you know, own and manage businesses where they have what I call a lot of skin in the game. So they want an advisor who really works with them and is is understanding their business and objectives and puts their puts them first. And that's what we're really good at. So yeah, I have a very confident view of the future for Thompson Snell and Passmore. Fantastic. And so it's almost as if AI is having that kind of un, unintentional impact of, of making the soft skills that lawyers need to succeed anyway, even more important. Yeah, I don't like calling them soft skills. Okay. It, it sort of sounds a bit weak if you've got a soft skill. I, you know, I will, I will make do with people skills, but I recently understood that a number of people are calling them power skills. Power skills. Power skills. Wow, I should I should know that as a coach. That's that's <laughs> yeah. good. And it's about that idea that the sort of skills that you need are the ones beyond the technical, beyond yeah. the intelligence. It's the the empathy. It's the ability to communicate, to listen, to empathize, to understand, and really, really get into the shoes of your clients. And as you know, you've got AI evolving and those sorts of things. I think it's it's the and I throw into that other changes that are happening, like hybrid working. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be able to manage remote teams. You've got to be able to have always. You've been got to be able to have difficult conversations. But as as you know, we go on. These these are these power skills are even more important. And what should firms be doing to try and deepen those power skills for their lawyers? I think there is a lot around training, you know, the, 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 but I really believe, very strongly believe that a lot of power skills are learned through osmosis. And that's about people um, listening in, overhearing conversations, hearing people deal with clients and picking it up from that and seeing how somebody handles a conversation, handles a client, and all of those sorts of things, which is very difficult to do if you're not in the office or you're not in the same place as you are with... Exactly the thought that, 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 that tr triggered in my mind. Yeah. Are they incompatible developing those skills with remote working? I think they are, to be honest. I think the lawyers of the future are going to be the ones that have picked up those power skills. And the easiest way to pick up the power skills is to be with people who already have them and observe and watch and learn. And so as lawyer skills are therefore evolving, does that change the way in which you you recruit and think about retention in the business? I mean, let's, let's be honest, you know, the genie's out of the bottle. People are never going to go back to five days a week, are they, in the office? That's not going to happen. I so right. what you have to do is make sure that the time that people spend in the office is valuable time and it's time that is with other people. I mean, I personally hate being in the office if I'm working on documents. I might as well do that at home. When I'm in the office, I want to be with people. And so we, for example, when we say to our trainees, when you're in the office, you need to be with your supervisor and with people that you can learn from. The hybrid working and all of that does help with recruitment because it does mean that we can fish from a bigger pool. The people geographically wider, we can be more diverse and inclusive of, of people's lifestyles. And it does help with retention. You know, people can get that work-life balance. We are not one of your magic circle big city firms that demand ridiculous amounts of hours. We do recognise people have work-life balance, and that's important, and that needs to be recognised. But equally, 
there is there is the 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 understanding that you know it, we have high standards although we're nice you earn that if you see what i mean so does that mean that that the working week is becoming organized differently in your firm in the sense of that when people are in everybody's in and together and therefore actively learning from one each, one another and then on on other days people are maybe doing more so solo tasks uh, is that kind of emerging that sort of that sort of there is a, a thing that at a minimum of two days a week in the office uh -huh. uh, departments have their own structure they may want people in more than that some people may prefer to be in more than that because you know home home environments are such that is not conducive to working at home uh, and that's as possible we also, each department has anchor days when everybody in that department is together. We also have uh, a very strong social side to the firm, and that's not um, without an underlying purpose. If we want people to get to know each other and we want people to form, you know, f relationships and friendships across the department so that they understand what it is the firm does, and they make those connections. So internal marketing of people is as important as external marketing. And does and does that flow in then to changing the culture at all of the uh, of the organisation? We have a very strong culture. I would describe that culture as one that we invest a lot in, particularly after COVID. It's very people orientated. It's about you're being authentic. It's about supporting people, collegiate, and as I said, recognizes the light, uh, the importance of work-life balance. I think COVID was very interesting for us for a couple of reasons. One, and I'm not for one minute saying it was a good thing, but it really emphasized to us how important culture is in keeping people together and their morale. And that, and we are we are very lucky that we had a very very strong supportive culture. But culture needs to be invested in, and that investment is as much from the top and what I call totem poles across the firm that are really re resemble what what the culture is. But also, as we came out of COVID, we knew we had to invest a lot of time in getting people back together. You know. What's that thing the Americans call the water cooler talks? But, you know, yeah, absolutely. But absolutely. it's those sorts of things. People need to have that. So we spend um, time and money on people having curry nights, tie nights, quiz nights, all of those sorts of things, which are about bringing people together and emphasizing that, you know, this is an important part of, of who we are. And the business was happy to invest in that, even though. The, the the returns weren't necessarily what's the word i'm looking for in indirect returns oh absolutely absolutely because actually the returns then become direct because they do hit your bottom line because it's all about people cross selling opportunities it is about working as a team it is about having clear communication across departments when they when there's you know working on on deals together it, it's it's not a nice; it's a must. And and you think you've made put more energy into that post COVID than than pre because it other pre it maybe it just happened. We did it anyway. Actually, yeah. maybe I don't I don't know if I'm using uh, the right kind. Yeah, of... no, we did it anyway before COVID. But what I sort of describe it as is like you had a lot of money in the bank when when COVID hit because you had a very strong culture during okay. COVID you took the money out of the bank. So you have to reinvest in the bank. And I mean, we did do a lot of social things during COVID, you know, remote wine tastings and, you know, all those sorts of quizzes and things like that. But we were very conscious that we had taken, we had, you know, relied a lot on that culture and therefore we needed to build it up again to make sure people felt connected to the firm and to each other. You you mentioned that you're, you're, you, you came through a, a more marketing and, and business development route into your into your role what, what's what's the firm's approach to, to bd how active are the the lawyers in in business development in the in the business or is it something that's more more marketing led 
how do you how do you approach that marketing is part of every lawyer and everybody's role in the firm i mean our lovely reception is a part of marketing and bd the, they create an impression a first impression and they're lovely and it's very much tsp our trainees you know mix with other trainees everybody is mixing everybody is has a part to play in marketing and, and BD in the firm. In fact, our marketing and BD team, I say, they're only successful if our lawyers are doing all the marketing and BD. They're the, they're the, they're <laughs> the professionals. I like that. They will get all the events. But they are literally creating platforms for people to go and do the marketing and BD and help them develop the skill sets. They will do, but the actual ammunition comes from the lawyers themselves. So e e even if you're a naturally bookish and academic lawyer who's come out of law school and you're, you know, nervous putting yourself out there, it's it, BD is something that the, the firm will encourage and, and, and bring out of, of that sort of more, more restrained lawyer? Yeah, because that person can write an excellent article on what's happening in or, or you know, a LinkedIn post or something like that. They might... Find there are loads of different ways people can do BD and marketing. It's not just about going and working a room at a cocktail event. And then, to be honest, cocktail events are a bit old hat now, aren't they? After yeah. after COVID, it's a long time since I've been to one of those. That's for sure. Exactly. So that you know, it's it's horses for courses. But you know, BD and marketing is also about how you handle your client. How 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 did the transaction that you're doing? Had, and I sit. We we're open plan here, and I hear our people talking to our clients, and the way that they talk is so lovely, and it's so caring, and it's very professional. But you know, and you just know that that is that's BD because people are going to say to them, "I had a great, you know, relationship with my advisor at." Thompson Stan and Passmore, I will recommend them. And there's nothing better than an existing client recommending you. Well, and, and that must be working if you're retaining clients generation after after generation. Yeah. And, and a real part of the culture of the firm, I imagine, too. Yes, clients, clients come first. And, you know, everybody impacts on the client experience. Everybody. Nobody in the firm is distant from a client. Everybody creates that special client engagement. And is that something that you 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 have to make people aware of, or is that almost something that's imbued in the way the business operates? So that's such a nice way to think about, you know, the business as a whole working together. Um, it's it's just part of who we are. We're mm. you know all support services, business support services are in the same building as buildings as our our advisors. We you know it, everybody respects each other. I have been in places where they back office the support services, and you know it's it's the it's the not so equal citizens or that awful phrase fianas and non fianas. Yeah, oh. cost centers. Yeah. Oh God, no! This is that. That's just just not not true. I mean, my going back to the marketing department. I have a fantastic head of marketing, and she's recently been doing sitting down, talking to clients, and doing client reviews, and finding out what clients think of of the service. And you know that that's that's from the 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 feedback that she gets and how useful that is cannot be underestimated. It's client listening, and and we're big fans of client listening on the oh. on the podcast because if 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 you if you don't know how your services land, you don't and you don't learn from the feedback you're given in how they they're delivered. It's really hard to improve and and really embed a relationship. So yeah, that's, yeah, that's, and we Charlotte recently also did what we called a client journey mapping exercise, where okay. literally looked at all the touch points that a client has with the firm. And made sure that they were as positive and efficient and effective as possible. So you literally mapped all key clients across the business? Yeah. Well, we took each department and we yeah. worked out how a client engages all the way from start to finish, soup to nuts, as the Americans say. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Quite an exercise. Yeah. It's not necessarily the big things. Uh -huh. It's just small things can make a huge difference. Right. Any you'd like to share? Any any leap to mind? Uh, any jump to mind? <laughs> well, it's, it's anything from onboarding a client mm -hmm. to how you communicate and how you invoice. The, everything, everything has to be client client centric. So. We we like to end our conversations by by trying to get a sense from our guests of what success means to them, and that's that's either you know that, as you would wish for the firm or for you as an individual. You know, how would you define success? Success. I think, put bluntly, it's about getting results, but it's how you go about that which defines. You are the leader. I hope I'm seen as honest and approachable, uh, brave in some instances, but I give clear direction and guidance. I'm someone who listens, but I'm not afraid of making decisions. I'm not here necessarily to do great things, but I hope to provide the context and platform for others to do great things. I think winning. I like winning, but I like winning as part of a team um, and achieving what we set out to do in the best possible way. But I also want to have fun. And I like also seeing people grow in confidence and skills. So that for me would be success. Brilliant. Winning with fun. I can't really argue with that. Oh, nice, fun. God, you know. Imagine if it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. I well, when people get too serious into it, and what we do is serious, don't get me wrong, but come on, guys, there's always an opportunity in the right context to make sure that people enjoy it. Look, it's been great fun speaking to you. Thank you for your, your contributions and, and your thoughts. And thanks for being on the Lawyers Coach podcast. Thank you for having me. So that was Oliver Hansard talking to Sarah Henwood. What are your key takeaways from that conversation? I love how we circled around this notion of, of power skills. So those skills that, that she didn't want to describe as soft skills, but are those that are beyond, you know, pure intelligence and, and, and technical skills. Great listening, our good old friend, empathy, and, and how important they are um, in terms of really making lawyers stand out and deliver that service. You know, there was a real echo, if you remember earlier on in the, in the, in the series, Claire, a re real echo of what um, Lee Curtis was saying about the, the importance of people's skills in delivering great legal service. And it's, you know, for me, it's preaching to the converted because my, my background is obviously business development in law firms. And I do a lot of work through coaching, as I know you do, with soft skills. And I think that soft skills need a rebrand. And I think we need to do that, Ollie. I think... Whether that's, what is it? Power skills now. Whether it's power skills or success skills, I don't know. We can we can pick that up as we go through. But you know, I think they need a rebrand because I think that calling them soft just devalues their importance. I right. And I think, I think you're right. You know, for those of us that work in business development, and it's interesting that Sarah has said the same, Lee has said the same. I certainly am always banging the drum for success skills because at the end of the day, people buy from people and relationships all come back to the to the EQ of the individual rather than the IQ. And I think it's it's lovely to hear so many guests this series recognising that and talking about it. And Sarah almost kind of continue that on it in the sense of everybody needs to play a role in that in that business development, be that getting the invoice right to the welcome that you get when you walk into the reception of the of the firm. So it's not just lawyers. BD can only succeed, obviously, and marketing can only succeed if lawyers are active in it. But it's it's the whole organisation needs to round on that business development activity and that delivering the great client experience. And again, for me, that's another thing that needs a rebrand, this idea of of Rainmaker, because I think the the trouble with Rainmaker is is it 
devalues the collective effort. I think everyone, you know, it's absolutely right. Everyone has a part to play. You and I have been in firms where, you know, you receive a welcome that you just kind of leaves leaves a really good impression, and you you go and a really bad impression, a really really well. bad impression as well. Yeah. And you know, a lot of that will be about the culture of the firm and how everyone is treated and and how everyone is valued and and you know how lovely to hear the chief executive of a firm recognizing the role that everyone has to play. And I think for me. You know, not only do we need to do that rebrand on soft skills, I think we also need to do a rebrand on business development and we need to to really underline the fact that it is a collective effort. Here, here. So who have we got coming up next? So next time, continuing the trend that we started with Nikki Owen, we are bringing in another non-lawyer. This time, Rob Bauer. Rob is managing partner at Montague Evans, a property consultancy also a partnership and he is going to be giving some insights into the current trends in offices particularly office space in london thanks so much and thank you for listening lawyers coach is brought to you by client talk and hansard coaching if you're a lawyer and would like to take part in lawyers coach please visit our website lawyercoach.co.uk for further details and you can also join the conversation on our linkedin group lawyers coach if there are any topics you'd like to hear us discuss then just get in touch 